Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is sovereignty. Now, something that's important if you're going to be studying international relations is asking yourself, who should we care about? Who are the major actors in international relations? And this video is going to address that issue. So here are some examples of some actors. We have international organizations like the World Bank or the United Nations. We have domestic leaders like a president or a dictator of a country. We have non-governmental organizations like the Red Cross. We have multinational corporations like Walmart. And we have military alliances like NATO. Now, those are all important actors, and we'll discuss them to some detail later in this series of videos. But the main guys that we really care about are states. I want to make a, a quick little distinction on states here. This is especially important if you live in the United States. There are two different things you might think of as states. You might think of states as like the U.S. or France or Japan or Georgia, the former Soviet Socialist Republic. And there are states like California, New York, Texas, and the Georgia that makes all of the peaches. Now, the states that I'm referring to and the states that we'll be referring to in general in international relations are the states on the left, something that you might think of as a country. I think the reason that we call states like California and Texas and so forth, I think the reason that we call those guys states is that it's an archaic term for how those guys were under the Articles of Confederation back before the U.S. Constitution existed. States within the U.S. had a lot of international power and freedom to do things with other countries individually and not just collectively with the United States. And so that's why we have that term state, and it's just been carried over from that time. But in international relations, we are talking about these guys, these country-like actors. And what makes them special, what makes these states states, is the fact that they're sovereign entities. That really ask another question here, what is a sovereign entity? What is a sovereign what does sovereignty even mean? And to answer that definitionally, sovereignty is simply the monopoly on the use of legitimate force within a territory. And therefore a state is just the sovereign entity of a territory. Now a quick little note here, a couple of quick little notes here about this definition is that murders, gang violence, and so forth, those are illegitimate uses of force. So just because you have murder and gang violence going on in the United States or another country doesn't change the fact that the United States is still the sovereign entity of the territory. It's just that those other acts of violence are illegitimate. And also you'll see that national governments delegate the power to use force, the legitimate use of force often. And so like local police, which are run by cities or counties, those guys actually use force and they're legitimate. They can go out and arrest people and so forth. But that authority stems from the fact that the state, in this case, Washington, D.C., grants that authority to the local police. Now, sovereign entities are not supposed to meddle in international affairs. Uh, with uh, other sovereign entities. So the United States can't or isn't supposed to go into Canada and start telling Canadian citizens how to live. And likewise, the Canadian government can't wander into the United States and tell U.S. citizens how to live. That's an established norm. It's more or less followed uh, often. And there are some cases that well, this is violated, and we'll talk about that in a second. But it's a norm, and it exists, and states are all aware of it. But sovereignty and the norm of not violating other people's sovereignty, while it exists today, it didn't always exist. This wasn't always the case. This wasn't always obvious that is, as it might be today. And to see what a world looks like back before sovereignty existed, I want you to think of a trivial analogy. I want you to think about your parents and yourself as a kid. Parents have sovereignty over their children, at least when we're talking about domestic family affairs. If you threw a baseball into your neighbor's window, for example, your neighbor can't actually go and punish you. Your neighbor can't spank you. Your neighbor can't ground you. Your neighbor can't do anything to that effect. It's up to your neighbor to ask your parents, your mom and dad, for compensation or punishment and so forth. Your parents have sovereignty over you, and your neighbors do not if you're a child. Now, if we apply this on a more international scale, you can think of two kingdoms here. So let's think of this with Kingdom A and Kingdom B in a world without sovereignty. So you have big A right here, this is the king, and you have a bunch of his regional guys. So these guys are all a part of kingdom A, but it's just that you know this guy might be a duke, and that guy's a duke, and that guy's a duke, and they all have this smaller region of territory which they claim to be their own, but it's also part of this bigger kingdom of A. And likewise, on the right side of the river, you have kingdom B, where this is the king right here, big B, and all of his little B minions. Now, imagine that little A down here, this guy, has a problem with this little B. Suppose that this river is flowing downward and the B guys up here are polluting the river and this makes it impossible for little A down here to get clean drinking water or enough water to water his crops. And so he's upset. 
In a world without sovereignty, what little A might do is he might go over to little B and say, you're stopping this right now and start shooting his gun or getting into a sword fight if we're going to keep a kingdom example running. Now, this is going to be a problem because this B down here, this guy, is going to come over to this big B, his king, and be like, look what's happening. I'm getting a little bit of an invasion from this little A guy. I need your help. And because this big B has a kingdom and it's all his, including this part, he's going to send his force over to this little A. He's going to fight him. Well, now little A is in trouble. This little A is being invaded by this big B, this big king guy. And so little A is going to go to his big A, his king, over here and ask for help. And so big A is going to send some military over to big B. And suddenly big B is upset because now he's being invaded by a king, King A. So King B is going to send his troops over to King A. Now King A is seeing a problem. He's being invaded. And so he's going to gather all of his minions, all of his little A's together, and start a big war against big B. And big B, of course, is going to respond by doing the exact same thing. So in this world without sovereignty, you have essentially chaos. What started out as just a simple little issue down here between little A and little B, little B was polluting water and little A was upset about it. Without sovereignty, you quickly had this situation devolve into chaos where a little water dispute between these two guys somehow affected these guys up here because these guys ended up getting into a war with these guys down here despite the fact that they had nothing to do with it and were very far removed from the situation. And the way that we sort of developed a norm to avoid these sorts of conflicts is sovereignty. So with sovereignty, the way it's supposed to work is like this. If little a has this problem with little b, little a doesn't go running and fighting little b. He doesn't send his military over there. He instead just goes over to big A and says, look, I have a problem with this little b down here. I need your help. And also, big A doesn't respond by going and running down this little B down here. He does not attack him. What he does is he goes over to big B and says, look, my little A has a problem. Your little B over here is polluting the water, and I need you to help me stop him doing that because this is having a very bad effect on my little A, and I don't want to get involved in a huge conflict over it. And so little, or rather big B will go down to little B and say, hey, look, you need to put an end to it right now because I do not want to get involved in a huge war over your silly little water dispute, so cut it out. And if Big B actually cares about that, that's what he'll say. And Little B will cut it out because he's afraid of Big B coming after him and starting a big conflict over that. And on the other hand, of course, if Big B really just is uncaring about the situation, he might tell A to go stuff it and they'll be in a war anyway. But this is at least supposed to allow diplomacy to have a chance at working. And it, it does work most of the time. We aren't always fighting each other, as as we'll finally see later on. Big myth dispelled. Most of the time, most places are not fighting each other. And it's a lot to do with this idea of sovereignty and this, this norm of sovereignty. It really helps things out with, with diplomatic affairs. And what got this all started, this is important, was the Treaty of Westphalia. It was signed in 1648. It ended the Thirty Years' War, and it established the principle of sovereignty that we have today. And because of that, it's sometimes called Westphalian sovereignty. So if you hear Westphalian sovereignty, it's essentially the equivalent here of, of sovereignty. It's just referring back to where we got this norm from. So what we've learned from this example with little a and little b and big a and big b is that dispute resolution between two substate actors occurs through the sovereign states it occurs through the sovereign big a and big b little a and little b resolve their disputes not between themselves but between their big sovereign entities and so sovereigns are supposed to ensure that their sub-state actors do not use force against foreign actors. So if little a went to invade little b, it would not be big b's responsibility to come and invade little a. Instead, big a is supposed to come down to little a and arrest him and stop him from doing that. Essentially because the alternative is that you end up in this big war that we saw earlier. So that's how you're supposed to keep this sovereignty. And these kingdoms are all supposed to run through these two guys where it's always big A negotiating with big B and so forth. Not these little guys associating themselves with the other little guys from the other side. Now... So in general, sovereigns are supposed to control their own domestic affairs, but you'll notice that states violate this rule all the time. This is a norm. It is. It really shouldn't be thought of as a rule because it gets broken all the time. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, let's think of some examples. Uh, quickly, United States' incursion into Pakistan to kill bin Laden, that's an example of a violation of sovereignty. If we're supposed to be following these norms between little a and big B and uh, little b and big A, then what's supposed to happen is the United States is supposed to go to the Pakistani government and say, we know where bin Laden is and we need you to go arrest him. But you'll notice that the United States did not do that. Also, the United States, when we were shooting down planes and establishing a no-fly zone in Libya, 
Guess what? That was a violation of sovereignty. Muammar Gaddafi was the sovereign entity, he was the sovereign power of Libya, and we overtook that authority. We said, no, you're no longer going to be doing this. We're going to help out your rebels. That is not... Uh, that that is actually a violation of of this this idea of Westphalian sovereignty, and likewise, Russia protecting South Ossetia from Georgia during that war in the summer of two thousand eight. Another example of a violation of of sovereignty. Georgia was supposed to be sovereign over South Ossetia, and Russia decided that it no longer wanted Georgia to be sovereign over South Ossetia. So we can see some examples of violations of sovereignty, and you'll notice that well, why does this happen? It's because strong actors can just get away with it. The United States is a strong actor, Russia is a strong actor, and they can sort of trample on other people's sovereignty and get away with it because they're big, strong guys, and there is no punishment. Big question, why is there no punishment? Well, it's because we live in a world of anarchy, and anarchy will be the subject of the next video. And so that will end things for today, and we will get started next time when we talk about what anarchy is and why states go unpunished when they violate these rules or this norm of sovereignty. Hope you enjoyed this video, and I will see you next time. Bye.